lame horror of Pedicherevu. If you were to travel from Guntakal by the meter gauge railway eastwards towards the city of Bezwada, now known as Vijayawada, you would traverse some of the best known and densest forests of the state of Andhra Pradesh soon after leaving Dronashalam Junction, when you pass Nandile and go through the stations of Basavapuram, Chalama, Bogoda and Digavamata. The forests on either side of the track are the only areas in southern India where the once numerous giant antelope, known as the Nilgai or Blue Bull, are still to be found. They are especially numerous in the jungles around the forest department rest house at a place named Chinamantralamana. These great animals, which once abounded everywhere, are now extinct in all the other forests of the south. In addition to the Blue Bull, the others found in the Indian subcontinent are numerous here, together with huge sounders of wild pig, and all these animals in turn attract tigers and panthers who are always to be found where sufficient food is available. But when this natural food becomes scarce for any reason, the carnivora are forced to prey on the herds of cattle, sheep and goats tended by the herdsmen who live on the outskirts of the villages. Then, and only then, do they fall foul of the men who attend the herds, and who naturally endeavor to drive away the marauders with spears, traps, bullets and other devices. Tigers and panthers are wounded or hurt in other ways too. This incapacitates them for normal hunting, and in time they take to man-eating as the easiest way of appeasing hunger. In the course of years many man-eaters have appeared in these areas. I have already told of one of them that haunted the railway tracks between some of the stations I have named and what follows is the story of another that appeared in the same general locality, but some miles to the north. To reach the spot, you do not alight from the train at Digavamata, but travel another 40 miles to Markapur Road. You detrain there and go by road in a northerly direction for another 40 miles. The road winds down a picturesque guard to an insignificant place known as Srisalem, overlooking the winding course of the Kistna River that formerly separated the Madras Presidency in the south from the dominions of the Nizam of Hyderabad in the north. The British have now gone, and so also have the Nizam's dominions, all these areas having been brought within the extensive state of Andhra Pradesh, the second largest in India, while Srisalem, hitherto merely the site of a large temple and of only religious significance, is becoming famous as the center of a great twin project involving an irrigation and electricity scheme. In former years, when conditions were undisturbed, this road from a point about 20 miles from Markapur Road railway station as far as the Kistna River was covered with the type of forest that tigers delight in, not too dense and not too thorny with sufficient high grass and low trees to afford cover for themselves and grazing and shelter for the wild deer and pig that form their natural diet. Low, rolling hills with interesting streams provided plenty of water for them in even the hottest weather, while the tiny jungle ticks that are the scourge of the forests further south, and the voracious leeches of the western ghats, both of them hateful to all carnivora who cannot rid themselves of these pests, seem to be entirely absent. At least the leeches are, while the ticks appear only after the rains and then in insignificant numbers. So tigers and panthers, particularly the former, were plentiful. They fed on the nilgai and the deer, and sportsmen did not visit the area very often. Elephants and bison strangely enough, are entirely absent from these jungles. The rare blue bull makes up for them in a way, but as it is protected and there is a total prohibition against shooting them, these areas have never been popular with tourists or sportsmen. The climate, too, is difficult, hot in winter and savagely hot in summer. Another factor that has saved the carnivora to a large extent is the paucity of motorable tracks into the interior. If you want to travel away from the main road, you either walk or travel by bullock cart. But all this made the jungles of Srisalem very pleasant to me. In their fastnesses I could lose myself, away from the crowd. There is a village named Pedicherevu situated to the west of the road from Markapur to Srisalem. To reach it you go by bullock cart through 18 miles of forest where you generally do not meet another human being. Pedicherevu is a small village, and to the south of it lies a pretty lake. The bullock cart track passes this lake and wends southwards for a few miles more till it reaches a hill. At an impossible gradient the track descends this hill to the hamlet of Rolapenta, where it meets another main road leading from the village of Doranala to the town of Atmakur. Further south yet is the rest house of Chinamantralamana, where the Nilgai abound. The lake I have just told you about is ringed by the jungle, and in this jungle many tigers are to be found. So many, in fact, that they have killed and eaten all the panthers that at one time lived there too. From November to January each year, during the mating season, after sunset and often during the daylight hours too, 
you can hear the moaning call of a tigress seeking her mate, and sometimes the awful din of tigers fighting for the female whose roars have summoned them from afar. I have told you in earlier stories that the natural food of tigers and panthers is the wild game of the forest, and when these become scarce, the herds of domestic cattle and goats that are taken out to graze. Man-eating is invariably the result of a tiger or panther becoming unable to hunt its normal food by some injury caused. In every case in my experience except the one I am going to tell you about, by a wound inflicted by man. Generally it is a gunshot or rifle wound, or injury brought about when escaping from a spring trap, when the animal has had to tear itself free from the teeth of the steel jaws that have fastened on its face or foot. But in the case of the man-eater of Pedicherevu it was none of these things. For after I shot him I found that this tiger, well past his prime, had been involved in a fight with another tiger. He had lost an eye and an ear as the result, both on the right side, where his adversary had gripped him, and the tendons of his right foreleg had been chewed through and through, causing him to drag that limb as he walked and to leave a distinct trail behind him. These disabilities, together with his advancing years, had prevented this animal from being able to kill his normal prey. A tiger's forepaws, and particularly the right one, are essential to him in normal attack, for with them he grips his victim while he bites the neck or throat, causing the animal to topple over and break its neck by its own weight. With his right foot maimed, this tiger could not hold any animal larger than a mouse deer. So he went through months of starvation while his wounds healed, and then he took to killing and eating every human being that came his way, for he found them slow in movement and quite helpless to resist him, even with his handicaps. The people of Pedicherevu told me later that they had heard a tigress moaning for some days. That was when this story really began. It was just before Christmas and the mating season. Two tigers had begun to fight for her. The quarrel had started at sunset and had lasted half the night. Both contestants had evidently been badly hurt, for one of them had come down to drink water at the edge of the lake, where he had left a pool of blood on the muddy edge. The other had crossed the sandy track leading from Pedicherevu to Rolapenta, on the Doranala Atmakur Road. The soft earth showed a distinct blood trail and three sets of pug marks, while a faint furrow in the sand showed that the animal had been dragging one of his limbs and could not put his weight on it. Time passed, and then a sheep or goat here or a village dog there disappeared, while as often as not the pug marks of the limping tiger, as he came to be known, showed that this contestant at least had survived the epic fight. The older men in the village shook their heads and conferred in whispers. Some of them had heard of such cases before. A few had actually seen them. But they all knew that the taking of the sheep, the goats and particularly the village curs, meant that a man-eating tiger was in the making. For tigers disdain such food and will only stoop to kill and eat such insignificant prey when they are on the verge of starvation, or when they are unable, for some good reason, to kill anything bigger. The first human victim was taken very soon after that, and the old men wagged their heads and their tongues yet more. He was a cartman and had been returning to the village in the evening with his cart laden with bamboos that had been cut in a valley five miles away. The cart track skirted the lake I have told you about, and here the man had stopped to water his bulls without unyoking them, for his cart was too heavily laden and it would have been impossible for him to re-yoke them again single-handed. Perhaps just before or after watering his animals, the man had got down from his cart to drink himself. That was when the limping tiger took him. The bulls, terrified at the sight of the tiger, had dashed madly away, dragging the laden cart behind them. They had not kept to the road, as a result of which the cart had fallen down an incline, the weight of the bamboos dragging the two unfortunate bulls with it. One had broken its thigh and the bone, protruding through the outer skin, had stuck into its belly, while the cart lay on top of the animal, effectively anchoring it. The second bull had been more lucky. The yoke had slipped off its neck, leaving the animal free to dash to the village. Its arrival there had caused consternation, but as night had fallen already nobody would listen to the pleadings of the cartman's wife and three children that the men should form a search party with lanterns to look for the breadwinner. The sun was already up next day when the able-bodied men of the hamlet, two of them armed with matchlocks and the rest with spears and sticks, eventually left the village. Very soon they came upon the capsized cart, and the unfortunate bull with the broken thigh. Of the owner there was no trace. They followed the tracks of the cart to the edge of the pool and there they saw in the mud the prints left by the limping tiger. 
Some of the searchers had wanted to look for the remains of the cartman, but the two individuals armed with matchlocks had become faint-hearted. One said his weapon was useless and would not fire. The other, more truthful, admitted he was too afraid. As a result the whole party returned to the village and the remains of the cartman were never found. The second victim was a woman. This incident also took place in the evening, but at a spot within a hundred yards of the village where she had taken her water pot to the community well. No jungle grew there, but nearby was a grove of people trees which, in turn, adorned a coconut plantation. A thick hedge enclosed this plantation, and on the further side was wasteland, covered with scrub and grass. The jungle proper began more than half a mile away. The well was at a spot where no tiger had ever been known to come within the memory of the oldest inhabitant, and he was well over a hundred years old. But the limping tiger came that evening. Two other women saw him in the act of carrying away his victim when she screamed. They turned around at the sound and were dumbfounded to see a great tiger, with a distinct limp, dragging the woman by her shoulder and moving at a fast pace towards the people trees. They had waited no longer and fled screaming to the village. Human kills had followed in rapid succession after that, and one day I received a letter from an old friend of mine, a Telugu Indian gentleman named Bayana, who lived near the Markapur Road railway station, telling me of the goings-on at Pedicherivu village and asking me to come and shoot the tiger. Moreover, Bayana offered to accompany me in order to render what assistance he could, and suggested I should travel by train to Markapur Road, from where he would take me in his Land Rover to our destination. Such a summon is impossible to resist, so I sent Bayana a telegram informing him I was leaving by express the following night. The next forenoon found us together on the platform of Markapur Road Railway Station. Mr. Bayana is meticulous, and looking after a guest is to him a matter of great importance, so important that at times it is all rather embarrassing. I was taken to his house where a hot bath had been ready for the last two hours. Then a huge dish of chicken pilau was placed before me and I was almost commanded to eat it all. I knew I would have to put up a good show, for Bayana is rather sensitive and would be greatly offended if I did not do justice to the meal. When this feast was over, I was taken to the garage at the rear of the house. There stood Bayana's Land Rover, laden to the brim with all manner of unnecessary things intended for my comfort. There was a spring cotton mattress, camp chairs, camp tables, a canvas camp tub, a camp basin and stand, a small refrigerator and a fan, both worked by kerosene oil, and heaven knew what else. As for foodstuffs, there were gunny bags in large numbers crammed with stores, enough, I should think, for a whole month. Four primus stoves, one of them with a double range cooker, had been provided, and pots, pans and storage drums for water were tied on at inconceivable points and at incredible angles. Where he and I were going to sit seemed an insoluble problem. Bayana asked me if I would like to sleep the night in his house and start next morning, to which I said I was as fresh as a daisy after that hot bath and marvelous chicken pilau. Could we start right away? Wonderfully obliging, he consented at once, and an hour later the Land Rover, looking more like one of those covered wagons from the prairies of America, took the road northwards that led to Srisalem. We left the main road a little beyond Doranala village and negotiated the rough track of 18 miles that eventually brought us directly through the jungle to the village of Pedicherivu, passing another hamlet named Tamalabailu on the way, the scene of an encounter with a man-eater in my young and inexperienced days. There I tumbled out of the Land Rover and sat on someone's doorstep, while Bayana rattled away in the Telugu dialect to the throng of villages that gathered around us. It transpired he was trying to find a suitable room for us to occupy. This did not take long, for the headmaster of the local school who had joined the crowd to learn the purpose of our visit, at once volunteered to let us live in the main hall of his little school. We drove the Land Rover there and unloaded. By the time we had taken everything out of the vehicle we had crammed that room to capacity, though more than half the objects were quite unnecessary. Water was fetched for us in pots by several willing villagers. We were conducted to the bathroom, in a separate building, where we bathed, and we were shown the lavatory, in yet another building. It was a long time before we could sit down to our first meal of curry and rice that Bayana had brought from his home at Markapur. Dusk had fallen by now, but people from the village still kept coming and going, to stare at us and ask innumerable questions which Bayana answered in Telugu at great length. 
Finally I took matters into my own hands. Selecting three or four of the villagers who seemed to know something about the man-eater, and carrying my rifle, I asked them to follow me outside. It was moonlight. The main street of the village led directly to the track that skirted the lake on its way to the Doranala Atmakur Road. Half a furlong away the lake began, and I could see the water glinting in the moonlight. I walked along the street with my companions, who very soon told me that it would be dangerous for us to leave the precincts of the village because of the man-eater. I said I wanted to talk to them where we could have peace and quiet, which was impossible in that infernal schoolroom, and I reassured them about the tiger. Finally we reached the edge of the lake and sat down by the water. It was delightfully cool there and the moonlight was so bright that we could see right across the wide expanse of the lake to the jungle on the other side. I noticed that my companions kept glancing nervously around, but as we were in the open with no cover for the tiger, there really was no justification for their fear. Little by little I learned of the tiger's doings, as I have already set them out, and my companions ended their narrative with a fervent plea that I should shoot the beast at all costs. I think Bayana must have wondered at my sudden departure, for he came looking for me with about twenty people and joined us just at the water's edge. We discussed plans as to what to do on the morrow. And that was when a tiger started to roar. From directly opposite us, on the other side of the lake, where we could see the dark edge of the jungle coming down to the water, he roared at regular intervals. To me that sound was pleasing, exciting, tempting and challenging. I had been told enough to know I would be able to recognize the man-eater at once by his limp, if I could only see him. I had talked enough and eaten enough, and those roars were very, very inviting. And the moonlight was so wonderfully bright. On an impulse I jumped to my feet and told my companions I was going after the tiger. They were aghast. But before they could remonstrate, I set off almost at a trot along the track that I knew skirted the lake closely for nearly half its circumference till it reached the other side, before breaking away into the jungle. I judged the tiger was roaring at least a mile away, maybe further, and I wanted to reach him before he stopped. Obviously he was coming down to the lake for a drink. In less than 15 minutes I was almost there, and the tiger was still calling, although at longer intervals. I knew that very soon he would stop. He was so close now that the earth seemed to tremble with each roar as I left the track I had been following to cut through the jungle towards the sound. That was when my difficulties began. I knew very well that if I attempted to walk through the undergrowth the tiger would hear me. He would either go away then or, if he was the man-eater, he might creep forward to ambush me by a flank or rear attack. My hope lay in finding a footpath if possible, and in following it in silence so as to try to see him first, an almost impossible thing to do. Luckily I discovered that footpath. Rather, it was a game trail that went down to the water and not a footpath, but it offered salvation, for it was leading more or less in the general direction from which the tiger's roars were still coming, although at longer and longer intervals. I started to follow the path, glancing down frequently to make sure I did not stumble or tread upon something that would betray my presence. I judged the tiger was well within 200 yards when he ceased to roar. I stopped advancing as soon as I realized this, for it would be impossible for me to locate him. Whereas he would assuredly hear my footsteps in spite of all my precautions in the complete silence that now enveloped us both. I thought quickly and had an idea. An acacia tree grew to the right of the game trail. Its trunk was hardly thick enough to hide my body when I sheltered behind it, but provided I remained absolutely motionless there was a hope that the tiger would not detect, at least, not too soon. Quickly I stepped behind the acacia, drew in my breath, and imitated the roar of a tiger with all the force of my lungs. Twice I did this, in rapid succession. Then I remained silent to await events. And happened they did, in real earnest. The tiger in front of me, apparently amazed and greatly annoyed at the impudence of the intruder who dared to come so close to him and roar twice, although those roars must have sounded miserably puny and weak, lost his temper. I could hear him coming, grunting and snarling as he bounded forward. Fortunately, the acacia had been growing at a spot where the pathway followed a straight course for a few yards, rather than at a bend. Before long, down the pathway came the tiger in short bounds, so intent upon looking for another of his kind that he failed to notice me behind the trunk of that acacia tree. He had passed when I was forced to put him to the test. 
I coughed almost imperceptibly. The tiger whisked around in his tracks to face this new sound. He knew it did not come from another tiger but from a man, and his reaction would show whether he was the man-eater or not. I did not move a fraction of an inch as the beast stared at the acacia. Having no sense of smell, he could not locate me exactly, although he must have seen some part of me and knew that something was sheltering behind that tree. He hesitated, and then stepped three or four paces to his left from where he would be able to get a better view of me. Recognition came to both of us at once. He found out what I was and where I was standing, while I found out that he was not the man-eater. For there was not the faintest trace of a limp in his walk. We stared at each other. The next three or four seconds would decide our fate. I certainly had no wish to shoot a harmless tiger provided he left me alone. But would he? I had excited and irritated him by roaring, and had made matters worse by coughing. An angry tiger cannot often control itself. The tiger sank to his haunches and I knew the charge was coming. I aimed and was about to press the trigger when one of those unaccountable events, that often make a tiger's behavior unpredictable, occurred. He turned and bounded into the bushes, allowing time for him to get away and for my nerves to calm down. I retraced my steps along the game trail to the roadway and back to the village where I told Bayana and the others, who admitted they had never expected to see me again, what had happened. To say I was disappointed would be putting matters lightly, but I was glad I had not made things worse by shooting the wrong tiger. During the next three days we bought four baits and tied them out at the most likely spots where nullers and pathways crossed each other, and within a mile or so of the big lake, and above each bait we constructed an almost perfect macken. That was how I came to meet an individual who, as events were to prove shortly, was as brave a man as any I have met. He was a Chenchu, the name by which the aboriginal jungle men of these areas are known, and he carried a bow and a quiver of arrows like most Chenchus do. These, and a filthy rag as a loincloth, were apparently his sole possessions. One more thing he had, and I think it was his greatest asset. Apu, for that was his name, had a most infectious smile, a marvelous sense of humor. He was as happy as the day was long. Apu offered his services in selecting suitable places in which to tie my baits and in building the makans, and I was quick to accept, for his smile won me completely. What wonderful makans he built! He concealed them so cleverly that, even when staring at one from the ground and knowing its location, it was difficult for me to realize a makan was there. Indeed, little Apu added greatly to my knowledge of the art of makan tying, for with him it was an art indeed. Nothing happened the first night, nor the second. The buffalo heifer that we had tied a quarter of a mile from the spot where I had met the roaring tiger was killed and half eaten on the third night, so that on the fourth night I sat over this heifer's remains, awaiting the return of the killer. Would it be the lame tiger, the man-eater, or would it be the roaring tiger, as I had come to call him, that I had encountered a few days earlier? Unfortunately the ground was so hard that no tracks were visible to answer this question in advance. The tiger returned before darkness had set in, which is something rare for a tiger to do, although sunset is the usual time at which panthers come to their kills. He did not even glance upwards at Apu's perfect macan but walked boldly up to the heifer's carcass and gazed down upon it. There was nothing wrong with his walk. He was not the lame tiger I had been told to look for. He was not the man-eater. The thought came to me to try a little experiment from that wonderful macan. I made the grating call of a panther. The effect on that tiger was astounding. He was galvanized into fury. He whirled around to locate the puny but audacious panther who had dared to challenge his right to his own kill. Where was this intruder? I called again, then stopped. Roared the tiger, and charged directly at the tree in which I was hidden. I had carried the joke too far. The tiger was furious and hellbent upon exterminating what he thought to be his spotted foe, hiding in the tree. Moreover the tree was an easy one to climb and I was only about 15 feet above the ground. The tiger disappeared from view as he got below the platform of my macken. The tree shook as he sprang into the first fork and I could hear the scraping of his claws upon the bark as he scrambled upwards, growling furiously. It was not a big tree and his efforts, together with his weight, set up a strange trembling that made my whole macken vibrate. 
matters had gone far enough. In another moment those enormous paws would reach up and tear the platform on which I was seated to shreds. I would be thrown off the tree and the tiger would probably jump down upon me before he could realize I was no panther. Shoo, 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 I screeched in desperation, leaping to my feet as I pointed the rifle downwards, waiting for his head or paw to show over the edge of the platform. The unfortunate tiger really got the shock of his life. He recognized the human voice and must have wondered what sort of panther could be above him, since it had, all of a sudden, turned itself into a man. And courage was not his strong point, as he had shown a few days earlier when he had met me behind the acacia. The growling stopped and the tree shook furiously as the tiger hurled his bulk to earth. He did not stop for a moment, but bounded into the undergrowth, then I heard the noise of his precipitate departure through the dry bushes. When I got back to camp one told by Anna and Apu and my other friends of the joke I had at the tiger's expense. They were all amused, but little Apu was tickled to death. He slapped his thighs with the palms of his hands and laughed and laughed and laughed. Almost gasping for breath, he choked over his words, but yesterday, the tiger heard a tiger that turned out to be a man. Today it heard a panther that became a man. It must be thinking it's going mad. Next day, I replaced the heifer that had been killed, and that very night this new heifer was killed. We had not changed the spot nor the macken where I had teased the tiger the day before. We were after the lame tiger, the man-eater, so it was an advantage to use the macken from which the other tiger, the stupid, roaring tiger, as we had named him, had been driven away. By using this macken again, we could at least be sure the roaring tiger would not interfere. So it followed that, when the slaying of the new heifer was reported at about 9 a.m. by a poo and a half dozen men armed with axes and staves, who had gone to inspect the various baits, my spirits rose in anticipation. At last I was to come to grips with the man-eater himself, for surely here he was at last. Filled with this hope, I climbed into the Macken early that afternoon and had not been there long when a mongoose appeared. He must have been extremely hungry, for he nibbled at the dead heifer and then started bolting mouthfuls of flesh until he was bloated and could hardly walk, before he toddled away. As if they had been awaiting his departure, a bevy of what are known in this part of India as, Gurges, a species of small quail, appeared in the clearing within a short time. They did not touch the putrefying flesh but started, pecking at the myriads of tiny beetles and other insects attracted by the stench from the carcass that was increasing with the heat of the day. Blue bottle flies settled in hordes upon the exposed flesh. There they would lay eggs that in a short while would hatch into myriads of white grubs. These would eat up the flesh and would, in turn be eaten by birds and insects that would come to prey upon them. In less than 24 hours that carcass would be reduced to mere bones by the action of maggots alone, apart from the scavengers of the sky, the vultures, that were already gathering for the final feast, and the scavengers of the night, hyenas and jackals, that would arrive for the scant remains after darkness had fallen. Then, of course, there was the rightful owner, the lame tiger as I hoped he would be, who should turn up by 8 o'clock at the latest. My reverie was rudely interrupted by the raucous but happy crow of a jungle cock nearby. He called, and I knew without looking at my watch that it was nearing half past five. Evening had come and I began to hope that the man-eater would be as obliging as his inoffensive cousin, the roaring tiger, by putting in his appearance before nightfall. Down by the lake which, incidentally, was behind me, two families of peafowl began to call to each other while what is known as the Golamuthi bird, from far away, gave her mating call. Every male within earshot, hearing that irresistible, enticing cry, would fly to her and before sunset she would have a number of suitors from whom to make her choice. Twilight soon enveloped the jungle, that period of uncertainty between daylight and dark, when the eyesight is most easily deceived and innocent shrubs and bushes assume the menacing appearance of crouching, watching beasts. A number of birds flapped heavily in headlong flight from a tree somewhere behind me. They gave voice to a shrieking alarm. Something had aroused a flock of crimson-headed parrots from their roosting place and they fled to seek another. Now why did the parrots do that? Maybe they saw a wild cat on the prowl. Or could it be the tiger? Time slipped by.
a number of miniature bats of the insect-eating variety swooped and dived at their invisible prey, taking them on the wing and screeching in sheer joy in such high notes, I am told, that it is beyond the human ear to register them. And I am right glad of that as the screeching, creaking noises they were making at the moment that I could hear were loud enough. A nightjar fluttered overhead and settled somewhere behind me. He started the chorus of calls that would soon be repeated by a number of his fellows. Then he stopped abruptly and took flight. I could see him sailing over the treetop. And a second later I heard a deep sigh beneath my macken, followed by complete silence. Although I could not see him, I knew the tiger had arrived. He was standing directly below me, and I sensed that he was inspecting the kill and his surroundings with the utmost care to make quite certain no hidden danger threatened. Would he look up and discover the macken? A nerve-straining period of inactivity followed. Then I heard a continuous small sound which I shall not try to describe, although I could easily identify it. The tiger was answering the calls of nature. I was elated. This was a good sign indeed. It showed he was not at all frightened or suspicious. The next instant the tiger walked boldly into view from under my tree. In spite of the fact that it had become very dark I could make out those cautious but purposeful strides that took him to the kill. There was not the vestige of a limp in his walk. He was certainly not a lame animal and therefore not the man-eater. I voiced my disgust beneath my breath. The tiger stopped as if he had heard me. Then he continued till he reached the dead heifer, where he halted to look down upon it. Without doubt he was my old friend, the roaring tiger. For a moment I was tempted to shoot him, for this animal was becoming a nuisance. He had taken two of my baits and probably would take a lot more. And baits cost money. Then I stopped to think. Could he be the man-eater, after all? What evidence did I really have that the man-eater was lame, beyond hearsay? Perhaps the story was all wrong. Maybe this was the man-eater, standing there, just waiting to be shot. But I recalled his behavior on the two occasions when he had seen me and found I was a man. That was not the conduct of a man-eater, he had acted more like a scared rabbit. Nevertheless, there was no getting away from it. This animal was becoming a nuisance. So I raised my rifle, aimed quickly at the ground under his belly and fired. The bullet struck the earth between his legs and in spite of the near darkness I could see the puff of dust it raised as it buried itself in the ground. As for the tiger, he arched his back like a frightened cat, then became elongated as he stretched himself for a mighty spring that took him clean out of sight. I came down from the Mackin in disgust, shouldered my rifle, and using a pocket torch to light the way in case I trod on a snake, made my way back to the village. The next day I bought yet another heifer and tied it out at the same spot. Surely the roaring tiger would not take it this time. And I made up my mind that, if he did, I would shoot him without compunction. This time he did not kill. Oh, he came there all right. The whole village and I heard him. He roared from about ten till near midnight. He had seen the heifer and was very hungry. But, mindful of a tiger that had turned into a man, followed by a panther man or shall we say a leopard man, and then of some strange thing that made an awful bang and hit the ground between his feet with tremendous force, he could not summon enough courage to kill the tempting bait. He roared his frustration and displeasure instead. Next morning no kills were reported, but little Apu had some news to give. He had found the trail of the lame tiger near one of the further baits. It had passed within a few yards of the heifer, even halting to look at it. Yet it had not killed the buffalo. Apu said he felt that the man-eater was averse to buffalo meat and would therefore not take any of our baits, however long we might try. He suggested I exchange the buffaloes for bulls and try again. He said he had another plan in mind. I inquired what it was. Apu grinned hugely as he suggested that he and I might go looking for the man-eater every night until we found him. A good idea, I replied. As good a notion as looking for a needle in a haystack. It took a little time for Apu to understand me. With haystacks he was familiar. But not with needles. After all, why should he want one? He wore no clothes. I suggested a pin, instead of a needle. That did not register, either. What had Apu to do with pin? Then I had a brainwave. I picked up a dried twig and twisted off the largest thorn growing on it. 
I went through the motion of hiding the thorn in a haystack and asked Apu how long he might take to find it. He shrugged. I said that this was like looking for the lame tiger in an area of jungle that extended for miles and miles. Apu's face brightened as he caught my meaning at last. He laughed and he laughed and he laughed. All this talk had made breakfast late, but we set out as soon as I had finished. Apu led me in a southwesterly direction from the lake, over the brow of a low hill and into a valley on the other side. A dry streambered wound along this valley and one of my baits had been tied at a spot where a fire line crossed this stream. The path we had just followed from the lake also crossed the stream at its intersection with the fire break and led onwards to a Chenchu settlement about three or four miles away. Chenchus do not live in villages. One stumbles upon a tiny circular hut of sticks and grass, scarcely noticeable in the surrounding jungle. A whole family of ten persons may live in one such hut. There may possibly be another hut nearby, or you may have to cover many miles before reaching the next. We had deliberately selected the junction point as the best spot for tying the bait, for a tiger coming upstream or downstream, or from either side of the fire line or footpath, that is, from any one of six directions, would see it immediately. And now, clearly in the dust of the footpath and coming from the opposite sides, were the footprints of a tiger. I studied them closely. There were the pug marks of three feet, instead of the four distinct impressions a tiger makes when he is ambling along, or the two marks he leaves when he is stalking by placing each hind foot upon the place vacated by the corresponding forefoot as it is moved forward to avoid treading upon a dried leaf or a twig. There was no doubt about it, this animal was using only three of his feet, and there was something wrong with the fourth. Hence he was unable to leave the quadruple trail normally made by a roaming tiger. At last I was looking at the man-eater's pug marks. The uneven distance between them indicated that he was limping badly, almost hopping along, while an occasional drag mark in the dust showed where he had tried to put his weight on that right foreleg but could not do so. It was clear that the injury was severe and that the wound had not yet healed. I came to the conclusion that it could not be a very old one. By tracking backwards for about 200 yards we reached the place where the tiger had come out of the jungle intending to cross or follow the footpath. Here he had spotted our bait and had deliberately walked up to it. We could see where he had halted to inspect the heifer from a distance of 10 feet and then continued on his way. This conduct puzzled me. Judging from the severe handicap from which the beast was suffering, he must be very hungry indeed, if not in a state of starvation most of the time. In that emaciated condition, why had he refused a meal that was his only for the taking? One could only conclude that he was not so very hungry after all, for hunger is an urge that neither a starving human nor a starving tiger can resist. We followed the tiger's trail after leaving our heifer. He had continued along the pathway for only another five or six yards and had then broken into the jungle where he had turned back to recross the streambered and enter the forest on the other side. Here we lost the trail among the dry leaves and hard ground. It appeared as if the tiger had decided to resume his walk to wherever he had been going before he had spotted our buffalo and moved closer to examine it. Apu and I decided we would ramble in his wake, or rather in the general direction he had been going, for as I have just said, the dry ground afforded no further trail. In a little while we came upon a game path. The ground was still too hard for us to see any pug marks, but we could make out the abrasions and scrapes left upon the baked earth by the pointed hooves of sambar and spotted deer, while a little further on a bear had recently been engaged upon heaving over boulders that bordered the path in his search for grubs and roots. Apu suggested that, after all, the lame tiger might have been making for this game trail and had probably followed it, although we could see no traces, and I agreed with him. The track seemed to be much used by wild animals, for not long afterwards we found the marks of a sounder of wild pig, coming from the opposite direction. Of the tiger there was still no trace. But a little further on we found we were right. Another cut across the path almost at right angles. The trail we were following led sharply down an incline into this nullar and up the other side, and clearly imprinted upon the loose earth of this nullar were the tracks of the lame tiger, leading away from us. They had been made the previous night and we had been correct in thinking that the game trail we were following was the tiger's route. We were interested and decided to find out where the tiger had wanted to go. We had covered more than a mile along that game trail when we reached the crest of a small hill and looked down the other side. 
Below us, leading across a small clearing, we could see a distinct pathway and knew that it was the rough road that led to the Chenchu settlement I have told you about. The game trail we were following had been but a shortcut that had led across the hill instead of going around it, and the lame tiger had been moving towards the settlement. We continued, and within the next half mile we discovered that our game trail led across the Chenchu roadway. Here the tiger had left the game trail and had walked along the roadway, for his tracks lay clearly in the dust before us. We followed him for nearly another mile, when we heard voices approaching from the opposite direction. Around a bend appeared some ten chenches, walking rapidly and talking loudly among themselves. All carried bows and arrows and half of them were armed with crude spears and axes in addition. They caught sight of us and came forward, talking excitedly, but before they could reach us we had overheard and knew the reason for their agitation. The man-eater had carried off a chenchu from the hamlet the previous evening. When they reached us they told us the story. They had all known of the presence of the man-eater for some time and went about, when they had to, in groups armed as they were now. But Kala, one of the their number, had always been a hunter and held all tigers, including man-eaters, in contempt. He had proclaimed that he was afraid of no tiger, while on the other hand every tiger walked in fear of him. Kala had taken his axe and his bow and arrows and his long spear that morning and gone out hunting. He had returned for a late lunch and had informed his wife that he had failed to kill anything, but consoled her with the news that he had discovered a beehive in a hole in a tree almost within a stone's throw of the village. Kala had left his bow and arrows and spear behind as unnecessary impediments and had taken his axe, a box of matches and some straw with which to hack out the hive and smoke the bees away, and also an empty tin in which to collect the honey. In a short while, some of the chenches heard the sound of his axe and had wondered how they had been so foolish as not to detect the presence of the hive before Kala had done. At that moment they were startled by a scream, Tiger! Tiger! Kala had shrieked. Then there was silence. Kala had not been popular and nobody, including his own wife, was in too great a hurry to rush to his rescue. They waited to see when he would return, but Kala did not show up. In due course the menfolk gathered together, armed themselves as best they could, and went to the hollow tree where Kala had found the beehive. The tree and the bees were there, and the axe, but no trace of Kala. Instead they found fresh gum oozing from the deep abrasions that had been made in the trunk of the tree as the tiger had stood on his hind paw and grabbed at Kala with the only forepaw he could use, his left. Necessarily, the operation had been a clumsy one as the handicapped tiger must have had to support his weight against the tree trunk while reaching for his quarry with one foreleg. This had given Kala time to scream for help. Had the tiger not been maimed, the Chenchu would not have heard or seen his attacker, while had the tree been a few feet higher, Kala would have been beyond the reach of the man-eater, which could not have followed him. The man-eater had dragged Kala through the bushes into the jungle, where they came across blood and the remnants of his loincloth. They had followed for a short distance after that and then stopped, for nobody seemed to have liked Kala very much. They knew he was dead. What was the use of following? Then they remembered that somebody had told them a couple of Darais had come to the village of Pedicherevu to shoot this man-eater, and they had decided to go there to tell them. But it was too late and darkness had already set in. So next morning some of the Chenches had leisurely finished breakfast before setting out to bring Bayana and me the news. That explained how Apu and I came to meet them on the way. My guide and I now knew where the lame tiger had been heading when he had observed our buffalo, and we also knew why he had not killed and eaten the heifer. Evidently he had made a good meal of the chenchu the previous night and had then wandered away for water. As likely as not he had visited the lake for a drink. There he had remembered his human kill and had decided to return and finish off what was left. He had been on the way back when he saw our bait but was not hungry enough to kill and eat it, and as likely as not he preferred the taste of the chenchu's flesh to tough buffalo meat, even though by now there could be little of the chenchu left. We told our part in these happenings to the chenchus, who now became enthusiastic and offered to help in trying to trace where the tiger had gone. We knew that if we succeeded we would find Kala's remains, but to them this appeared of little importance. Primarily, they wanted me to shoot the tiger, for as long as he remained their lives were in danger. With the eleven chenches to follow the trail, 
We went in the wake of the lame tiger for another few yards before we found he had again turned into the jungle. This time his passage could not escape those eleven pairs of searching eyes and in due course we came to a small, dry nullah, up which our quarry had turned. We could see his footmarks, while one of the chenches whispered that their settlement was hardly a quarter of a mile away. Within a short time we got the smell of the cadaver, and a little later we heard the hum of a thousand bluebottle flies. At last we had come to what remained of the unfortunate Kala, the man who had been a little too cocksure. He had met the fate of many a hunter before him, and the fate that is in store for many more the world over. The fate that comes to those who are overconfident and careless. There was very little left of the Chenchu. His head had been spared. Also his hands and feet, the usual portions of the human anatomy left by a man-eater. Even his shin bones had been chewed and splintered, and some of his ribs, while sections of his spinal column lay about with hardly any flesh on them. The man-eater must have been very hungry. Indeed, he must have been almost starving to have made such a meal. Again I wondered why he had spared my buffalo bait, which would have provided him with a far bigger repast. A short distance away one of the chenches discovered a thigh bone. Of the other there was no trace. A hyena or jackal had probably carried it away. We discussed the situation in whispers. My companions were divided in their opinions. About half said that I should sit up for the tiger that night in a macan they offered to construct, while the other half were convinced it was a waste of time, as the man-eater would never return. There was nothing left for him to eat. Yes indeed, a hyena would come, certainly jackals. A tiger. Never. Tigers were not carrion eaters. Then I remembered that the lame tiger appeared to be a very hungry animal, and I had no doubt of the course I should follow. I would sit over the remains of Kala that night, come what may, there was a chance, albeit a slim one, that the tiger would return. I told my companions this and even the doubtful ones now saw my point. With enthusiasm, one and all set to work, and under the direction of that expert on Makans, Apu, once again a wonderful structure took shape before my eyes. Apu had selected a bushy tree that grew some 35 yards away, and from the Makan the Chenches built on it, rather higher than usual, being some twenty feet off the ground in order to gain an uninterrupted view of the remains, I would await the doubtful return of the man-eater. We brought the solitary thigh bone to where the other bones lay, so as to keep them as closely as possible together and offer a more tempting sight that might at least bring the man-eater forward to sniff at them. Leaving Apu to the task with the other chenches, I hurried back to Pedicherevu for something to eat and also for my night equipment. Bayana was excited when he heard the news and wished me luck. It was past four o'clock when I returned to find Apu and two others perched on the Macan. They had covered the few remains with leafy branches to conceal them from the keen sight of vultures, and these branches they removed when they left for the Chenchu settlement, where Apu had elected to spend the night with the others. With the departure of my henchmen, I began to think about the lame tiger. I wondered if he had really been maimed in a fight with another tiger as reported, or by a gunshot wound fired by some poacher, as frequently is the case. Undoubtedly the animal was very severely handicapped, so much so, in fact, that he must have lacked the confidence to tackle the heifer I had tied out for him. I concluded that this was the real reason why he had left it alone. This tiger would indeed prove to be in a very emaciated condition, necessarily dependent on the few small animals and other creatures that he could stalk and tackle upon his three sound legs till such time as some lucky chance presented itself and he found and killed some unfortunate human being. With this thought came fresh hope. A tiger as hungry as this would surely be tempted to return to the scraps that were left, even after the full meal he had made the night before. The evening drew to its close in comparative silence. There were few birds and small animals, such as monkeys, in this part of the jungle, or they were strangely quiet for some unaccountable reason. This was unfortunate, for not only are the sounds of the forest for me endless source of delight, but it is upon the cries of alarm made by these smaller creatures, as well as the members of the deer family, that I largely rely to tell me of a tiger's movements. Once or twice, in the distance, a partridge called, but of jungle fowl and peafowl there was no evidence. I wondered about this till the answer came suddenly. The Chenchu settlement. Those little marksmen, with their bows and arrows, had wiped out all the edible birds within a considerable radius. Darkness began to fall and the birds of the night, 
being less edible in Chenchu opinion than their unfortunate cousins of the day, and certainly far more difficult to hunt, began their calls. I welcomed the sounds that broke the monotonous silence of the evening I had just passed. A night heron wailed in despair from the bed of some dry stream, and his cry was answered by a companion further down the valley. Far away, a pair of jackals raised their haunting call. A squat kind of wood cricket inhabits the forests of Andhra Pradesh in large numbers, which I have never come across nor heard in the jungles of Madras and Mysore. This little insect chirrups loudly, and when hundreds of them chirrup together the noise is loud enough to drown all other sounds. At times these vibrations synchronize and the resultant throb has the intensity of a tractor working nearby. I had been listening to this noise that had started soon after sunset. It appeared to be growing steadily in volume and intensity as more and more of the insects joined in the chorus. Nothing else could I hear. Suddenly there was a sharp diminution of the sound. The crickets in the distance appeared to have stopped chirruping, and in a matter of seconds those nearer to me, becoming aware of the silence of the distant companions, stopped chirruping too. It was as if the tractor had come to a sudden halt. The ensuing hush was relieving to the nerves in one sense but in another way it was strangely foreboding and terrifying. Just what had made the crickets stop their chorus? The night herons were still wailing to each other in the distance when I first heard the cause, the call of the man-eater. He roared in the valley, once, twice and again. Now I knew why the crickets had ceased their chorus so abruptly. They had heard the first roars of the tiger that had been inaudible to me because of the din they were making. Only after they had stopped was I able to hear him. But what had the man-eater got to do with crickets? Why should they fear him? I fell to wondering at the answer to this question. It intrigued me so much that I decided to put it to a friend of mine in Madras, who is a naturalist. The answer, as I found out later, is a simple one, and I shall tell you about it before I end this story. The tiger was still roaring. He roared and roared as he came closer and closer. Obviously he intended returning to the remains of Kala, the Chenchu, but why was he roaring in this fashion? It was as strange as it was unusual. When a tiger returns to his kill he does so in absolute silence, using the utmost caution to conceal his every movement with each step he takes. He certainly does not advertise his presence by roaring. I was intrigued and awaited the answer in what he would do in the next 30 minutes. He came as close as about 50 yards from my Mackin, but there he stayed put, hidden in the undergrowth, while he continued to roar. Never for a moment did he come out or show himself, although after some time he started to move around my Mackin and Kala's remains in a wide circle, while his roaring grew louder and more fierce. It did not take long to realize that the man-eater knew all about my presence in the tree overlooking his kill. But how could he have found out? He certainly could not have discovered my wagon, for he had started roaring a long while back and quite a considerable distance away. Thus it was clear that he had known about me and the Mackin from the very start, and that he was trying to frighten me away. There was only one way in which he could have found out. The man-eater had been lying in concealment all the time and had watched us build the Mackin. He knew some hated human enemy was awaiting his return, and that a return spelt great danger to him. Like all man-eaters, this tiger had an inherent fear of the human race, but in this instance the urge to eat again, in spite of his last big feed, was making him bold enough to think he could drive his foe away by roaring loudly and often. He had evidently followed Apu and the other Chenchus as far as their encampment and had now come back in the hope of being able to gnaw a few bones. The man-eater continued to roar as he circled again and again, and I waited in patience to see what he would do. There could be only one answer to this intriguing situation within the next half hour or so. Either the man-eater must become impatient and take a chance, or I would become impatient and go down in search of him. The third alternative was that the tiger would go away and I would lose him. At all costs, I must not allow that to happen. Time passed. Half an hour. Then another ten minutes. But the man-eater did not show himself. Instead of continuing to move around in a wide circle as he had been doing, the tiger was now evidently lying on the ground, or perhaps sitting on his haunches, in a thicket that I could just make out as a big, black void in the darkness that was softened by the stars that shone brilliantly from a clear sky. 
and from this thicket he was roaring and roaring with unabated vigor and fury to drive away the person or persons he well knew were hidden in the tree where he had noticed such activity in the afternoon. When there is something to be done, I am not a very patient person, and the urge to act was growing stronger with each moment. So at last I started to descend the tree as silently as possible. As stealthily as I moved, I knew the man-eater would hear me. If only he would give me time to reach the foot of the tree and walk the few steps to where Kala's bones lay. Danger lay in the risk that he might attack while I was halfway down. Then I would be helpless, as I would not be able to use my rifle. I could feel the sweat of fear pour down my face and my hands were slippery with it. But I controlled my feet to move as silently and surely as possible. To fall now and hurt myself would mean lying on the ground entirely at the man-eater's mercy. I was about halfway down when the roaring ceased. He had heard me and guessed that his quarry was on the move. Would he come closer to investigate? Naturally, he would. He might even then be only a few feet away. The thought made me shaky and I quickened my descent, almost slipping once or twice. I had to feel for each foothold, although the stars gave enough light to make the ground visible. A great feeling of relief and thankfulness surged through me as my foot touched the earth at last. Quickly I brought my loaded rifle, which I had to sling over my right shoulder while making the descent, to the ready, while I stood with my back to the tree to meet the charge I expected at any moment. The quietness was intense. Not a leaf stirred. The crickets were silent. The man-eater must be creeping towards me now. Surely he would make some sound, the faintest of rustles that would tell me where he was and give me a chance. But he made no sound. There was no rustle only an unearthly stillness. Then it happened. The strain on the tiger had been as great as it had been on me, and he could contain himself no longer. With a shattering roar, he charged. But he came from quite a different direction from what I had expected. He launched his attack from behind and not from the bush in which he had been hiding. I heard the roar and whirled around. The tree trunk was in my way and I could not see him coming, although I had switched on the torch. The stream of light was thrown back into my eyes by the trunk before me and a dark void lay beyond. The tiger could not now check himself despite the bright light that faced him. A mass of snarling fury, he was suddenly before me, appearing out of the darkness from behind the tree trunk and to my left. I leaped to the right, desperately keeping the tree between us, and fired hastily from the shelter of the trunk at a massive head, not more than two yards away. The tiger tried to turn while continuing his blind rush forward and had reached the tree before my scattered wits responded to the urge to work the underlever of the point .405. The spent cartridge case flew out of the breach and I had time for a hasty second shot at the confused, blurred hindquarters of the tiger. He disappeared, and silence fell once more. I listened intently for the sounds I hoped to hear, the gurgling death rattle of a dying animal, or the deep, sad moaning of a badly wounded beast. At least the angry roar of an infuriated creature that has been hit in some place. I listened for the crackling, crashing noise made by a wounded animal in headlong flight, heedless of where it is going so long as it succeeds in getting away. But none of these sounds was to be heard, absolutely nothing at all. I waited perhaps for ten minutes, or fifteen, with the beam of my torch still on the spot where the tiger disappeared from view. Still the silence continued. No distant alarm cries from Samba or spotted deer marked the movements of the man-eater. Could my first shot have been fatal? Perhaps the tiger had dropped dead a few yards away. Then at last I heard a sound. It was the chirruping of a cricket. Others joined in, singly and in twos and threes, till once more the jungle was filled with that vibrating, rasping, uneven sound. It was as if the hidden tractor had been put to work once again. Of one thing I could then be certain, the man-eater was no longer in the vicinity. Relieved of the tension, I lowered the beam of the torch on my rifle to examine the ground at the spot where the tiger was when I fired at his head. Then I moved slowly forward, looking closely at the earth in the direction he went. I passed Kala's bones and reached the place where he disappeared. But nothing was to be seen. I moved forward till I reached the thick undergrowth and the ground was hidden from view. I examined the leaves, the twigs and the blades of high grass as I moved on in the direction taken by the fleeing man-eater. But there was not a drop of blood to be seen, nor any sign of disturbed, 
bitten or clawed undergrowth, no evidence of any wounded creature having passed that way. Then I remembered the deep silence that followed my two shots and was convinced at last of the shocking fact that I had missed, not once, but twice, and the first at point-blank range. Not knowing the way to the Chenchu settlement in the darkness, I climbed back into the Makan and spent the rest of the night in bitter self-recrimination. The man-eater would now become more cunning than ever and would never return to a kill again. As a result he would be hungry more often, and this would lead to him killing more frequently. The Chenchus, and other unfortunate people who lived in that area, would have to pay the penalty. The man-eater would now exact an indirect payment for my poor shooting. It was 4 a.m. before I fell asleep, to be awakened shortly after dawn by a poo and nearly a dozen chenches who had accompanied him to ascertain the result of the shots they must have heard the previous night. Shamefacedly, I related what had happened. A poo said nothing. He merely looked at me with one raised eyebrow. There was a wealth of disdain in that look, and he knew I knew it. There was nothing to do but ask our Chenchu friends to report at once if they heard or saw anything, more of the man-eater, and then Apu and I took the weary trail back to Pedicherevu. Neither of us spoke the whole way. We both felt that, under the circumstances, the less said the better. Bayana tried to cheer me up when he heard the story by giving a short discourse on the law of averages. In effect he said I had to miss some time if I did not want to miss every time. I was not impressed and went to sleep. Nothing happened during the next two days and Bayana said that we would have to return to Markapur very shortly for fresh supplies, for, incredible as it might seem, that great stock of foodstuffs we had brought with us was running low. Personally, I think he had given up hope and had come to feel that the man-eater was too cunning for us. Here was where little Apu showed his mettle. He told Bayana to go to town for the fresh supplies while he and I would scour the jungle from dawn to dusk in an attempt to meet the tiger. My friend agreed, but added that he thought we were wasting our time. Bayana left for Markapur at six next morning, while Apu and I set off at the same hour to try to meet the lame tiger. This time the Chenchu brought not only his axe but his dog, a lanky, cadaverous cur, whose ears had been cut off as a puppy to avoid attracting the hordes of horse flies, as they are called in India, that pester horses and dogs in later life by collecting on their ears. I do not know the real name of these pests, but I am told that they belong to the same family as the African tsetse fly. Their bite, unlike that of their African cousins, is quite harmless, although very sharp and painful. This apparition of a dog, which Apu addressed as Adiapa, looked as if he had not eaten for at least six months. Now Adiapa is a man's name in the Telugu dialect and definitely not that of a dog. I asked Apu the reason and he replied that Adiapa was his neighbor's name, a person whom Apu disliked intensely. He had, therefore, named the cur after him to insult the neighbor. In this strategy, however, Apu had come off second best, as he went on to add with great resentment that the neighbor, who washed clothes for a living, had retaliated by giving the name Apu to one of his donkeys, which he used for carrying the bundles of dirty linen to the tank for washing. So Apu and I, with the Kura Diapa dodging between our legs, circled the lake once again, this time along the eastern shore and not by the western approach where the track from Pedicherevu made its way to the Atmakur Doranala road. The scrub was thinner at this end of the lake, and as a consequence feathered game like peafowl and partridge were quite plentiful. We also put up a small herd of black buck, an animal normally not found in the vicinity of big jungles and usually confined to wastelands bordering the cultivated areas. One old stag, with a jet black coat and white underbelly and an enormous pair of corkscrew horns, regarded us with studied indifference till a diapa took it into his head to give chase with a series of hungry yelps. The stag and his harem disappeared and the cur came back to regard us with mournful, accusing eyes. Very plainly he was upbraiding us in his doggy mind for having missed the chance of giving him something to eat. The black buck, which is the most beautiful of the few species of the antelope family in India, was also at one time the most plentiful and roamed the wastelands all over the peninsula in thousands. Since those days they have been relentlessly pursued with bows and arrows, firearms, dogs and all manner of ingenious traps, till today they are but few and far between, scarcely to be seen in their old haunts and in real danger of extermination. Rules for their protection exist on paper, written in government offices and printed in notifications and gazettes, 
but nobody pays heed to them, and the eventual disappearance of this beautiful creature from the face of this earth seems a certainty. To make matters worse, the blackbuck belongs to the order of animals that chew the cud. That is, their food is swallowed after being partly masticated and passes into the stomach where digestion begins. From here it is returned to the mouth again for further mastication before being finally swallowed. During this process the animal is incapable of quick or prolonged movement and tires easily. If chased for a distance, it falls to earth exhausted and helpless. The indigenous hunters and village poachers know this, and they also know exactly how long after grazing the second digestive process begins and for how long it lasts. So when they observe a herd feeding, they watch patiently till the animals squat down to chew the cud. They wait for a few minutes more and then give chase with packs of dogs, guns, bows and arrows and what not. The frightened antelope tries to escape, but the younger members and the females cannot go far. They collapse exhausted and are either torn to bits by the pursuing dogs or killed at close range when the men come up. To continue with my story. Apu and I had not gone far after seeing the black buck when we crossed the tracks of a family of four Nilgai or Bluebull, as they are better known. As a rule these animals graze alone. This quartet had gone down the previous night to water at lake. These big antelope leave tracks that look very like those of their cousins of the jungles, the giant sambar deer, the difference being that the former are much more pointed and rather more elongated. At this point we halted. For, superimposed over the tracks of the four nilgai were the pug marks of a big male tiger. Apu and I studied the ground carefully and started to follow the tiger's trail for a short distance. Soon we confirmed that he was not our quarry, the lame man-eater. This animal had all four of his feet intact and was suffering no handicap whatever. Undoubtedly we were looking at the pug marks of our old friend, the roaring but very timid tiger that seemed to insist on haunting us as well as the precincts of the lake. He was no good to us anyhow, while the lame man-eater, being also a male, was hardly likely to keep him company. We went on and on, working southwards, till by midday we judged we were at least ten miles from the lake which, according to my pocket compass, lay directly north of us. We did not want to go too far as the man-eater had hitherto confined his activities to within about this radius. So after a whispered consultation Apu and I changed direction and set off on a northwesterly course that should, before evening, bring us to a point due west of the lake and within a couple of miles of the little Chenchu settlement where I had met my last adventure. Here we ran into difficulties. Such game trails as we did cross ran at right angles to our course, from southwest to northeast, as the animals that had made them through the years had gone towards the lake for water. So we could not avail ourselves of the natural assistance they afforded by following them, but had to follow a direct course towards our destination by struggling through the jungle. This made for very hard going and slow progress. Every few yards we would come up against thorny bushes or clumps of heavy vegetation. These we had to circumvent. Thus the distance we had to cover was more than doubled and took much more time than planned and required frequent reference to my compass. The sun was scorchingly hot at 3 p.m., and we were both bathed in perspiration when we reached a small hillock. There was an overhanging rock facing us on one side of this hillock, and from the base oozed a tiny trickle of fresh water, only a few drops at a time, which had formed into a puddle no more than a couple of feet in diameter. The supply of water was so small that a stream could not form and the liquid soaked into the ground at about the same rate as it dripped from the rock. As a result the water was fresh and crystal clear, and to our overheated and tired bodies as welcome as an oasis in the Sahara. But there was this difference. Clearly imprinted in the moist earth were the tracks of the tiger we were looking for. In fact there were many pug marks to be seen, for by accident we had discovered his regular drinking place. Among the tracks was the blurred drag of his limping foot in places where he had rested it on the ground while he drank. There was no doubt about it. We were looking at the tracks of the lame man-eater at last. Jubilation filled us, both at discovering the tracks and at finding water to drink. I placed the point .405 on the ground and lay on my stomach with just one thought for the moment and that was to drink, and drink and drink. I never bothered to see what Apu was doing or even to think about him. I suppose with the usual Sahib's accustomed attitude of taking things for granted, my subconscious mind, if it thought at all, expected Apu to wait till I had finished. It was good that Apu actually did so, 
for my subconscious mind was apparently not up to form that day. For, as I was enjoying the ice-cold water, the man-eater decided to charge. There came a tremendous roar from the right of us. And again. And then the man-eater was upon us. Groping for the rifle with my right hand, I crouched on my knees, turning around as best I could to face the rush. A terrifying apparition greeted me. The snarling form of the tiger was racing towards us in lopsided, bobbing bounds. He was but 15 feet away. Apu stood his ground, maniacally flourishing his axe in sweeping circles to meet that onslaught. Yelping frenziedly in front of his master, the dog Adiapa, which up to this moment had showed no sign of being any more than a ludicrous, half-starved cur, stood with bared teeth to meet that awful onslaught. I suppose the tiger, too, thought the sight before him frightening. The people he had so far killed had been taken by surprise. They had screamed but offered no resistance. In this case a man stood before him, whirling something round and round, while a despicable cur, that he would not have condescended to look at, seemed to want to fight. The only craven thing in the scene and up to the tiger's expectations was the second individual who was rolling on the ground, evidently in abject fear and unable to get up. The tiger halted for a moment, and in that moment the man-eater had made his greatest and last mistake. The man on the ground, myself, had found his rifle at last and did not get up because he was kneeling to take aim. I fired then, and twice again. An examination of the dead animal confirmed what I had been told. He had been turned into a man-eater by the severe damage to his right leg suffered during a fight with another tiger. At least, in this case, man was not to blame. To Apu and his dog, Adiapa, I am grateful that I was able to tell by Anna, when he returned from Markapur very late that evening with a fresh stock of foodstuffs, that his labor had been in vain. Had the stocky little Chenchu and his large-hearted dog not stood the ground but run away, the man-eater would never have paused in his rush and I would not have lived to tell the tale. To conclude, I will explain why the crickets ceased their chirruping when the man-eater started roaring. My naturalist friend at Madras says it is because the tiger's roars made the ground vibrate. Apparently crickets cannot hear, but they have an acute sense to touch. The vibrations had given them cause for fear, perhaps even an earthquake in the offing. The crickets had stopped shouting at least. The end.